Good morning, welcome to River City Church. So glad to have you join us online this week. And I am joining you from a favorite trail in Hespler. I love walking the trails at this time of year. It can be so beautiful to be in the woods and so peaceful and calm in our neighborhoods. But I hope that you've been out doing some great things for your neighbors this week and that you're gonna participate in the next level of our Love Your Neighbor Challenge. Now being out in the woods uh, does mean I need to put on the right things to go out at this time of year. Today, we're not gonna be talking about putting on, that's coming next week, but uh, today we're talking about putting things off and putting things off in a good sense. So you're gonna get rooted and built up from the book of Colossians in a special way. Uh, if you're new here today, and have just checked in with River City Church for the first time, or maybe it's been a first few times, we're always so glad that you came. And if you would like to get connected with us and find out more about this church and whether this is a place where you can grow your faith and get to know God better, find out more about Jesus, then you can go to our website and click on Contact Us. So in a moment, Sean's gonna take us into worship. At the end of this, uh, episode today. You're going to hear some announcements regarding that Love Your Neighbor Challenge. You're also going to hear something about the women's and men's events. And I also want to talk to you about communion. So hang on to the end and don't check out early. Find out what's going on in community and find out how you can get involved. All right, let's head over to worship with Sean. Looks delicious. I love pancakes. Well, good morning, River City. I'm sure that many of you enjoyed a pancake meal just like this one this past week. This past Tuesday was Shrove Tuesday, which I remember growing up as a kid. We always had pancakes on Shrove Tuesday, though I didn't always know why. And it's because Shrove Tuesday is the day before Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of a season called Lent. Now, Lent is the 40 days that precedes Easter, not including Sunday. So if you count backwards from Easter Sunday, 40 days, and skip over the Sundays, you land on Ash Wednesday. Now, traditionally, Christians uh, in the past, during the season of Lent, they would fast from all animal products, uh, all meat, uh, dairy, eggs. And so on Shrove Tuesday, the day before uh, Lent began on Ash Wednesday, Christians would use up all of their milk and eggs and butter and make pancakes. But while the beginning of Lent starts with eating pancakes, the season of Lent is actually very different. During Lent, it's an opportunity for us to uh, reflect on the 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert, fasting and praying. And it gives us an opportunity to fast and pray as we move closer and closer to the day where Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so as we go into worship this morning, we're going to use some of that rich tradition of the ancient church. We're going to uh, start with a prayer of St. Ephraim. And this prayer is a prayer that was written for Lent in the fourth century and has been prayed by the church for 1600 years. And so as these words, they're modernized in English for us, as they come up on the screen, I invite you to just pray them aloud or in your head and just really allow them to serve as the entry for us into Lent. And then after that, we're going to sing a song together called the Kyrie eleison, which just simply means in Latin, Lord have mercy. And so as we come into this first Sunday of Lent, I invite you to pray with me and sing with me the words of the ancient church that help us to reflect and prepare ourselves for the journey towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday.
So in basketball, when you uh, stop uh, traveling with the ball uh, and uh, you want to uh, throw a pass or take a shot at the net, and if an opponent is standing in your way, one of the crucial skills that you've got to be able to accomplish uh, in order to be a successful basketball player is you've got to be able to pivot. So you keep one foot planted and you're shifting the other foot over here and that gets you away from the opponent and it opens up another laneway for you to pass the ball or to take a shot and this keeps you from traveling. Pivoting is a critical basketball skill that every basketball player has to master. 
Pivot is also one of the words that we've been hearing a lot during pandemic, right? It's one of the catch words of the past number of months because each and every one of us has had to pivot, right? We've had to shift many, many times because of this virus called coronavirus that's been blocking us doing things the way that we are accustomed to doing them. So we've had to open up new pathways uh, for doing our lives. And uh, it's been a season where everything changes. A season where everything changes. Well, I expect that for most of you, like for me, uh, this season of everything changes isn't the first time in our lives where we've had uh, a period of our lives where it felt like everything was in flux. Everything was different than it used to be. Uh, for some of you, it might have been when you graduated from high school and, and you went off to college or university. It's a pivot time in your life. For others of you, maybe it was when you graduated and you entered the workforce as a full-time employee, a pivot time in your life. For many, it's when they go from being single to getting married. That's a pivot time for, for a big time, right? Uh, if I reflect on my life, uh, without a doubt, the, the biggest time when it felt like everything changed was when our first child was born, when our son Eric was born. Uh, I mean, that eclipsed every change that preceded it. It was, it was a bigger uh, transition than getting married, bigger than graduating, bigger than entering the workforce full time. Because now we had this little baby, right? And prior to that baby arriving, uh, if I wanted to go golfing, uh, I didn't need to like kind of work a schedule out with, with my wife Barb, I just went golfing. And if I was going to be gone for several hours golfing, that wasn't an issue. But now that we were both taking care of this child that we'd been blessed with, we had to kind of negotiate schedules. We had to make sure that the, the balance was fair. We had to make sure that Eric was being able to spend time with both parents. And it was a way that everything changed for Barb and I in other ways too. It was the first time that we ever uh, got life insurance. It was when we drafted a will. Uh, for our family. Uh, again, it was a pivot time in our life when everything changed. Maybe think of a pivot time in your life. Well, this church, River City Church, is a, is a mixed church community. And by that, I mean that we include people in our church community who are longtime believers and believers who are brand new, right? So a long-time believer could be someone who uh, has been a Christ follower for many, many years. Maybe your own parents uh, were Christian. You were born in a Christian home. You were raised that way. Um, that certainly was my case, right? I was, I was raised by committed Christian parents. Uh, my grandparents were committed Christians. And even my great-grandparents, and I suspect even my great-great, but no one alive seems to remember uh, any details about that. On the flip side, some of you are brand new to the Christian faith. Uh, Dan, who's a member of this church, uh, he's a member of the men's group that I'm in, a uh, small group Bible study. He got baptized a year ago, July. So he's been a Christ follower for, for maybe 18 months or so. So he's a, a very new Christian. And so Christian teaching and Christian ways uh, they're, they're all very new to him. And, and some of you can relate more to Dan's story than, than to my story. You, your parents weren't Christ followers, uh, let alone your grandparents. Uh, you're a first generation disciple or follower of Jesus Christ. And so the Christian teaching is new to you. Uh, the Christian way of doing life or living is new to you as well. In many ways, it's, it's like you're in uncharted territory. You're in uncharted territory. Well, if that second reality is more your reality, then you have an advantage because you're going to be able to understand and relate to the members of the various house churches in and around Colossa. And uh, these are the churches that Paul, the apostle, wrote to in his letter to the Colossians. All the members of those house churches, and earlier in this series I mentioned there were uh, at least two and probably three house churches. All of them were first-generation Christ followers. Epaphras, who planted those house churches, had started them 
five to eight years before Paul wrote this letter. So at maximum, <clears throat> the most mature believer who was part of those church communities had been a Christ follower for like eight years. So not very long, right? But these were passionate new Christians. They were passionate new Christians. But again, this whole way of living as a Christian, this whole way of being a Christian in a culture that's not, that was new to them. It was, a, it was uncharted territory. Question. Do you think these new Christians got it right all the time? Imagine, imagine that this was you. Imagine you're starting this whole new way of life in, in Jesus Christ. Do you think you, you would get it right all the time? I'm sure the answer is pretty clear. Of course not, right? I mean, old habits are hard to leave behind. Uh, and the bulk of your life, the majority of your life has been spent living one way and now you're trying to live a different way. It's been spent not even knowing Jesus, let alone following Jesus, and now you're trying to follow him in a culture that largely is not. And because most of your life was lived without Jesus, the chances are that you still have lots of Christian teaching to learn, uh, lots of Christian doctrine or teaching to understand, and lots of Christian habits and spiritual disciplines to develop. And so many times you'd, you'd be torn between your old way of life, the one that you knew and the one that you had been living, and this new way of life, the one that you were being called to in Christ. I think of it this way. In my hand, I'm holding uh, my favorite running shoe. Or it's one of the shoes that are my favorite. And you can see this is a, it's a ratty, dirty, old shoe. I don't know if you can see, like it's all torn apart. Um, this shoe is probably six or seven years old and it stinks. I'll put it down now. But that shoe is the one that nine times out of ten I'll wear. Even though I have new, a new set of running shoes, I wear these because they're comfortable. Uh, it's like they're formed to my feet. And I think that if you've lived most of your life as a non-Christian, and then you become a Christian, I think that that old way of life would be like a comfortable pair of shoes, right? A comfortable pair of shoes that kind of just feel like they fit. And even though they're dirty and they're smelly, it's what you know. It's what's familiar and it's what's comfortable. You see what I mean when I say that those new believers would have been torn between the life that they lived and the new life that they were being called to. Torn and probably tempted as well. Because before Christ, anything goes, right? I mean, so long as you weren't hurting someone else, as long as you weren't breaking the rules of the land, you could pretty much do what you wanted. But now that you're following Christ, you've got, well, you've got God's commands to consider. You've got the life that Jesus lived to emulate. But truth be told, it isn't just new believers who sometimes feel torn like that. And it isn't just new believers who feel tempted at times. Long-time believers can feel tempted as well. They can be tempted to go against the life that they know God is calling them to. I know this because I'm a long-time believer, and I too am tempted, just like the rest of you. In fact, the scriptures tell us that Jesus himself was tempted. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, it says, Jesus was tempted in every way, even as we are, yet was without sin. Now, I can't say that. Right? I wish I could say that, but I can't. But I can say, though I'm a longtime believer, I know what it is to be torn, right? Sometimes seeing how my unbelieving friends live, I can be attracted to that. And then I'm tempted. I'm tempted as well by the things this world admires, the things that our secular culture celebrates and values, those are sometimes temptations for me as I expect they're temptations for all of us. Well, our text today is for new believers, right? But uh, it's going to apply equally to those of us who are longtime believers as well. In our text today, we're going to learn how to handle being torn 
and tempted in a way that glorifies God, in, enable, in a way that enables us to experience more victories in our daily lives than defeats. So this text, again from Colossians, is chapter 3, starting at verse 1. God's Word. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We'll just hit pause there for a second. So here Paul is telling believers how they can live in such a way that they're going to feel torn less, that they're going to feel tempted less than they would otherwise. And that there are two things that we need to do, two things that are part of not being torn or tempted as often as we would otherwise be. And they're listed right here in our text. Number one, we're to set our hearts on things above. And number two, we're to set our minds on things above. Now, hearts is pretty obvious. That refers to our passions and our desires. And minds, it's pretty obvious too. That refers to our our thoughts, what we entertain in our thought life. But what are these things above uh, that Paul speaks of here? Well, things above refers to heavenly things. Things above refer to the things of God, right? Right? Believers are to set their hearts, their desires, on the things of God. And we're to set our thoughts, our minds, on the things of God. And we do this by seeking first God's kingdom and God's will and ways, or um, God's righteousness. Father, how can I live as a kingdom citizen today? How can I live a righteous life every second of every day? God, show me the way. When that is your prayer, when that occupies your thought, when that fills your desires, then you will be setting your hearts and your minds on things above. University of Tennessee conducted a 12-year study on stress. This will be interesting. 12-year study on stress. For 12 years, they examined a, 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 a group so an experimental group and a control group. And uh, every day, these two groups were exposed to five-minute broadcasts of the news, right? The experimental group every day, however, received broadcasts that always contained at least four negative messages. Four negative messages. We'll get this. At the end of the study, the experimental group was more depressed They believed the world was a terrible place to live. They were less likely to help others in need. And they believed that the negative things that were broadcast in those five-minute daily news updates were inevitably going to happen in the very near future. And you say, well, what does that prove? Well, it shows that what we fill our minds with really does matter. It also proves that the thoughts that you have today not only affect your life today, but they can affect you years down the road as well. Friends, the most important decision that we can make is is not what we eat or what we wear. The most important decision that we make on a daily basis is what we allow to occupy our minds, what we allow ourselves to think through again and again in the course of our day. And Paul instructs the Colossian Christians to set their minds on heavenly things, things above. See, every sin begins with a desire or a passion or a thought. (laughs) These days, we don't need to search for earthly things to spark our desires or to occupy our thoughts. We are bombarded every day by media agendas and government agendas. We're bombarded by advertisements everywhere we look. And these advertisements include images and messages promoting passion and sensuality and even lust. It is what it is. That's the world. That's the society 
that you and I live in today. So if we don't develop the discipline of thinking thoughts above, if we don't develop this discipline of thinking heavenly thoughts, then our thoughts are going to be preoccupied with earthly things. Now, question. Is controlling our hearts, is controlling our passions, our desires, is that easy or hard? I'd say, I'd say it's incredibly hard. And what about our minds? Is it easy to control our thought life? I'm sure you agree that also is incredibly challenging sometimes. And it's challenging not just for new, young believers. It's challenging for all of us, for long-time believers too. After all, we don't live in heaven. (laughs) We live on earth. And generally speaking, we don't see the things of heaven, but constantly we see the material things. We see the things of earth. And so desiring God's ways and desiring God's kingdom, well, it's going to take persistent focus. It's going to take practice, and we aren't always going to get it right. We're going to need, at times in our day, or in times, at times in the course of our week, we're going to need to hit the pause button, and we're going to need to reflect, and we're going to need to confess when we fall short. And then we're going to have to ask God for a clean start, knowing that each and every time that we ask God for a clean start, He freely gives it to us because of Jesus and what Jesus has done for us every time. But this new life as a Christian who focuses on the things of heaven, the things above, this new life as a Christian who desires and thinks about God's higher way, that new life, it it takes incredible discipline. Do you desire to live this Christ life? Do you desire to experience more victories and fewer defeats in your daily Christian walk? Now, I know that not all of you listening are believers, but I know and you know that it isn't just believers that get tempted by things that they really don't want to give in to. All of us feel torn between the life that we want to live, the higher values, our best self that we want and things that are going to keep us from that. And so today's message on how to resist feeling torn, how to resist those temptations, it's of benefit to all of us for believers and unbelievers alike. It's of benefit to those who want to live with greater victory and fewer defeats. And if you really want success, right, then the thing that you need to do is you need to have at least one accountability partner. You need to have one other If you're a believer, another Christ follower that you can count on to to call a spade a spade, right? When you're veering off track, they can say to you, listen, man, I'm concerned for you, right? Do you have that? If you do, then this week or maybe today, take some time and thank that person. Tell them that you appreciate how they're helping you to experience greater victory in your daily life. And if you don't have that, well, now you know what you need to do if you want to experience and live that life of victory. The fact of the matter is, without focus and without discipline and without intentionality, we will default to the path of least resistance. We'll default to what's familiar. And if you're a new believer, what's familiar is that old life, right? It's that pre-believer life. And even if you're a veteran believer like myself, you'll default to that earthly way of living because it's surrounding us each and every day. Here in our text, Paul is calling us to a higher and a holier path. It's the path of greater resistance. Next, Paul goes on to name some earthly things that would occupy the desires of the people that he's writing to, so the believers in those various churches in Colossae. And let me warn you up front, there's quite a list here. And as you hear these, as I'm reading this, and as you hear these, and these will come up on the screen as well, I want you to answer this question in your mind. Are these things different today? Or do people today also set their thoughts, their desires on 
the things that Paul mentions in this list? Are these just issues of people who lived in bygone days, or are these issues that we still wrestle with today? Uh, first, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived, right? Speaking to new believers, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and, have, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that's quite a list that Paul gives us. Now, would you say that those items in that list, that those items are things that are no longer issues for people today? Have we humans over the past, what, 19 or 20 centuries since Paul wrote this, have we evolved beyond things like greed and anger and lust and sexual immorality? Have we outgrown these things? Has all of the technology available to us, has it enabled us to progress beyond these things? Or has modern education shaped us into the kind of people who no longer get torn or tempted by the things in the list that Paul includes here? I'm sure you'll agree that the answer is no. <laughs> Uh, sadly, these are things that we still struggle with in 2021. When I consider a list like what Paul gives in this passage, I have to admit that my conscience convicts me. It's like, Daryl, your thoughts, your, your, your passions, your desires, and the things that you think about are too, too much down here and not enough up here. They're too much on earthly things, and they're not enough on godly things. And maybe, maybe your conscience convicts you as well. And when our conscience convicts us, we have one of two natural reactions. Uh, it, it's kind of fight or flight, right? The flight one is this, that we don't want others to know that we struggle with these things, least of which we don't want other people in our church community to know that we struggle. And so... To hide that, we either stop being active in our church community or we give up on the Christian faith altogether. That's the flight one. And then there's the fight one, right? Uh, when our conscience convicts us, we fight. We get defensive. Uh, and one way that people, including Bible scholars even, have gotten defensive when it comes to this list in today's passage is they'll say things like this. Well, don't forget... Colossians was written by Paul, and yeah, Paul was a Christ follower when he wrote this, but he used to be a Pharisee. And so that he sounds judgy and puritanical and overly concerned about sexual immorality and impurity, well, that's just Paul. And so we kind of dismiss that. We, we fight by getting defensive. But this isn't just Paul. Jesus, too, focused on these very things, and in multiple passages. I'll just reference one of them. In Mark chapter 7, verses 20 and following, Jesus said, and this will come up on your screen as well, Jesus said, the things that make people wrong are the things that come from the inside. All these bad things be begin inside a person. They begin in the mind, bad thoughts, sexual sins, stealing, Murder, adultery, greed, doing bad things to people, lying, doing things that are morally wrong, jealousy, insulting people, proud talking and foolish living. These evil things come from within a person, from inside a person. And these are the things that make people unacceptable to God. So maybe the fact that these things are mentioned multiple times in the New Testament by Paul and Jesus 
doesn't relate to Paul's puritanical values, but to the fact that these things are serious and they're a struggle for all of us. They're a struggle for all of us. Last year, another, another respected or formerly respected Christian leader fell. His name, Ravi Zacharias. He was uh, an adored apologist. That meant that he was a, 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 a gifted defender of the Christian faith. He would travel around the world um, and he would speak at university campuses and he would speak against these people that were great at debating against the Christian faith and he would debate for the Christian faith and, and he was charming and he was winsome. He was a defender of the Christian faith in words at least. Shortly after Rabbi's death, even a quick review of his devices, his cell phone, revealed contacts for more than 200 massage parlors and massage therapists in the United States and around the world. And it included hundreds of images of women, some that showed women naked. A little further investigation revealed that he not only frequented day spas, he owned some in the Atlanta area, and he solicited and received photos of women until just months before his death at the age of 74. And these actions of Ravi, they cast a long dark shadow all of, over all of his good words, over all the books that he wrote and the videos that he appeared in. It's absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, imagine the pain and the shame for Margaret, his wife, of, his wife and supporter of some 48 years. And I imagine the pain and the shame of his staff at uh, Ravi Zachari International Ministries. And my heart truly goes out to them too. I'm not only saddened, I'm humbled by this story. What if the reason sexual morality and lifestyle lists are repeated by both Paul and Jesus in the New Testament is because this is serious stuff and believers better watch out because if they don't, they end up hurting themselves and the ones they love. So in a nutshell, Paul's message to the believers in that Corinthian uh, in, in that Colossian church and in those house churches is this. While it's true that old pre-Christian habits die hard, die they must. And now there's something that I want to share about our passage that I haven't shared thus far. And uh, this is something that gives me incredible encouragement and hope and even strength as a believer. Want to know what it is? Of course you do, right? It's this. All the statements in Colossians 3, uh, verses 5 through uh, 10, all of those statements are a mix of indicative and imperative. A mix of indicative and imperative statements. And you're like, big whoop, right? Well, it is a big deal. And let me explain why it's a big deal. Indicative statements relate to our standing in Christ. These are things that are already ours. They're not things that we have to earn or work for. Um, it's not our responsibility. These are things that are a gift from God because of Christ and what he's done for us. And you say, well, what are the gifts in this passage? Well, as I count through this passage, I count five uh, indicative statements, five gifts that God gives believers. And we have these already. These are ours in Christ. Number one, ver from verse three. Where God is concerned, if you're a believer, then you are already, you're already dead to your old way of life, your unbelieving way of life. Verse 1, where God is concerned, if you're a believer, you're already raised, you're already raised to this new life in Jesus. Verses 3 and 4, where God is concerned, your new life is hidden with Christ. Heaven is literally waiting for you. Verse 9, where God is concerned, he no longer sees you wearing your old dirty shoes, right? Your old dirty life. 
And then verse 10 related, even now when God looks at you, he looks at you in Christ and he sees only your sanctified, holy, purified self. It's amazing, right? And we need to remind ourselves of those indicatives. We need to remind ourselves of those constantly. You might say, well, if all that's true, then why should I be devoting so much energy and intentionality and focus and discipline to setting my heart and my mind on things above, right? On heavenly things. And that relates to the other part of our text, which would be the imperatives, right? An imperative is a command. And this passage includes a number of those as well. And these commands, they they describe our state, They describe what believers are supposed to do as a result of all that God has already done in Christ. And there are statements of command here. I see at least three commands, and these are our tasks. This is what we're called to. Verses 1 and 2. Set your hearts and your minds on heavenly things. It's not something god is going to consistently do for us it's something that we have to develop the discipline to do ourselves verse 5 put to death all practices belonging to that old sinful nature right again jesus blood shed on the cross it renews us from such things that's the gift part but the task part is that now we need to daily renounce those things we need to quit doing them we need to leave them behind verse 9 Rid yourselves of practices belonging to that old self, right? Uh, Take off the old shoe and put on the new shoe that's been given you in Christ. I love the way that one commentator puts it. He writes, what's our task as believers? The answer, to become in daily experience what we already are in Christ Jesus to become in daily experience what we already are. And Paul makes that point perfectly clear in the final verse of today's text, verse 11. Here, that's in the Christian community, there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. One of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible. Christ is all and and in all. Now some of those terms on the screen are ones that you'll recognize, but some of them are going to seem barbaric. But guess what? That's exactly what they are. They're referring to people that at that time and in that culture, the civilized people would would think that those people are beyond redemption. They're beyond saving. They're beyond regeneration in Christ. They're beyond hope, in other words. And Paul says, nope. No one is beyond hope. And you need to hear that. All of you. You need to hear that no one, absolutely no one, is beyond hope in Christ. In fact, here in the Christian community, River City Church and other, here in the body of Christ, no person is beyond redemption. Here in the Christian community, instead of looking at all those things that we used to look at to differentiate ourselves from other people, right? Our standard of living or the neighborhood we live in or our ethnicity, our nationality, our skin color, our sexual orientation, whatever. We don't look at those things anymore. Here in the Christian community, we look at the one thing that unites us, the all-important thing, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. And here in this Christian community, Christ Jesus is is all and Christ Jesus is in all. Amen? Amen. So this week, let's leave, uh, let's leave the old dirty, smelly shoe behind. And next time, for those of you who return, it's going to be all about this new self that is ours in Christ Jesus. I want to welcome you back for that. And lastly, I just want to say that if this morning's message has raised a question or questions for you, uh, you'll see my email appear there. And I want to be available to you whether you live in South Africa or South Galt. 
So if you have a question, write it down now so you remember it and then get behind your computer or type it on your phone, send it to that email and I'd be happy to respond. Let me pray with you and for you. Holy Father in heaven, sometimes it feels like you ask a lot of us. In our passage today, you ask us to set our hearts and our minds on things above, not on earthly things. And that feels so challenging because we're just surrounded by earthly things and the lure of them, the temptation can be strong. Thank you for today's reminder of what we already have in Christ. Thank you for how you see us because of Jesus. And would you empower us through your spirit, uh, through the Christian community, through help from one another, to leave the old life behind and to walk uh, this new life in Jesus. Uh, Bless us in this day. Thank you for the gift of this day. Help us to be a blessing. And finally, God, your your word says that we're to pray for workers uh, in the harvest field. Your word says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so at River City, we do. We, We ask that you would raise up workers, that you would Even now, as I pray, stir in the hearts of of young women and young men in this church and all of us to have a burden for people who don't yet know Jesus. Hear this prayer in his name. Amen. Have an awesome day. Well, thank you for tuning in today to River City Church Online. Now, speaking of that Love Your Neighbor campaign, that Pete Postma was amazing. In fact, he was so amazing, he had his picture into me before I had even finished lunch on Sunday. That was amazing to me. So if Pete can do it, you can do it. I know you can. And I'm gonna give you some tips on how you could win one of three more gift cards this week. So you could maybe uh, shovel someone else's driveway, a neighbor's driveway. You could brush their car off and get the snow off their car. Uh, You could text a neighbor and say you're outside on the driveway and you might want to talk socially distanced with them for a few minutes. Or maybe you're just going to continue to wave and say hi. That's okay too. Just send me a little picture. Uh, with some evidence, either send it to our social media feed or you can send it to info at rivercitychurch.org and I will put your name on a gift card this week. So get on it and send those pictures in. Whatever it takes to love your neighbor this week. Okay, so coming up next week, we're going to be celebrating communion. And we had such a good experience last time in the end of January. We want to do that again. It was really amazing to watch everyone again partaking of elements together in that Zoom call format. So we're going to be having communion next week at 11 a.m. on Zoom. And we invite all of you to join us. If you're a little concerned about the amount of time that you're spending on Zoom calls, I want to assure you that Our communion is only going to take about 20 to 30 minutes, so it's going to be fairly short, but it's really worth your while. Tonight we have a couple of uh, events happening yet. Okay, so the women's event tonight is happening at 8 p.m. It's a dessert and coffee on Zoom. We're also doing the men's event, not tonight, but it is coming up on Friday, uh, the 26th at 8 p.m. as well. The links for both of those Zoom events have been sent out in e-news already. So if you've got your e-news, you've got the link. If you did not get the e-news, you can email info at rivercitychurch.org this afternoon. And I will sort that out. I will send you a link so you can join us 
and enjoy some company online. Now, during this time of year, I just wanna encourage you to do whatever you can to connect with others, whether it's loving your neighbor or joining us on Zoom calls to see some of your community from River City Church and do whatever you can to keep yourself in a positive space as we muster through the end of February. I hope you have an excellent week and join us next week for Rooted and Built Up. Again, Daryl will be talking about putting things on and this is gonna be a compliment to what you've learned today. All right, see you next week. Bye for now.